All right, good morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, your word is powerful and strong, and you give it to us that we might know your ways and walk in your ways, be instructed in your clearly higher ways than ours. And I pray that we would step into what it is, your high calling in our lives. And I just pray that we would be blessed and we would be a blessing to those around us because of what it is that you speak to us this morning. And we ask this accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever noticed that those who live in the world, those who are without Christ, are very demanding people? Have you noticed that? Very self-centered. And as self-centered people, they go after a selfish lifestyle and build their own kingdom, as it were. But if you're after the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you recognize that your life is a life of sacrifice in which you're willing to give. So there's this dichotomy that exists as we are here on planet Earth. We are givers and the world... (laughs) Takers, consumers... They'll take anything they can get and try to destroy your life in the process. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in the work environment. There's always somebody trying to push you down so they can rise up and be the successful one. So how do we handle such things? How are we to live on this earth? Let's go to Judges chapter 17 first. I want to show you something there with the nation of Israel when they were without a king and how they would act when they were without a king. Judges chapter 17. Let's start in verse 1 after you get there. Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from you, on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, Here is the silver with me, I took it. And his mother said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my son. So when he had returned the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Do you see anything wrong with how this is progressing? This mother is saying to her son, I've dedicated this silver to the Lord. Go make an idol. This is strange, I know, but this is here in the Bible for us. Now, let's continue verse 4. Thus he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith, and he made it into a carved image and a molded image, and they were in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and a household idols, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Verse 6, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Do you see the problem in Israel? When there was no God-centered leadership, everybody started doing what they thought was right in each household, and we get a close-up view of what was happening in this household, a mother and son decide to make a, a silver image. They consecrate their own priest who will help them worship this carved image. And the problem is stated in verse 6. When there was no king in Israel, the people did what was right in their own eyes. Is that how the world is living around us? Everyone's doing their own thing. Well, here is what we say at this church. Jesus is the king, and we advance his kingdom, right? That's what we're always talking about, advancing the kingdom of God and doing what his will is. And if that be true, if we are advancing the kingdom of God, then our attitude will reflect that we have a king. Because the the dichotomy there is if you have no king, you will set up your own kingdom. You will advance your own plan and your own will. But if Jesus be your king, then you live now a life of sacrifice. Now, it's difficult whenever you see somebody doing whatever they want, consuming whatever they want, and you can't. How many of you have ever felt like, well, that's not fair. They can just do whatever they want. It seems like they never get in trouble. But if I step out of line... God gets me just like that. I know, Don, you've shared that with me. You can't even say a bad word about someone, and God's like, 
hammering you down, right? And it feels like everybody else gets away with everything, but here we don't get away with anything. And God is restricting us, and as Lillian says, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that God is restricting us and not allowing us to get away with everything. So we're going to learn about this lifestyle as, as the world is doing whatever they want and actually inflicting pain upon us. We have a lifestyle to live in front of them. So let's go to Psalm 29. And we're going to lift, look at this lifestyle that we're to live in front of this unbelieving world. Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. The first statement that we're going to deal with here is giving to the Lord. How do we give to the Lord? Marty, if I said give to the Lord, what would you... What would you do? What, what's your first thought? If I finances. Finances. How many of you think that's how we give to the Lord? You give in the offering, right? Is that what you're talking about? When the offering plate comes around? How else do we give? Yeah. It's how we treat other people. It's how we give to the Lord. And I would agree with you. Yes, there is something financial. That, that's a command that we give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. But that's not what it's talking about here. Yeah, giving our praise, our adoration to Him. Certainly we're going to look at that. But let's go to Proverbs 19. I want you to see something in Proverbs 19. I'm sure you've probably even quoted this before. Proverbs 19:17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. So what does this verse mean? He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. And God's going to give it back to you. He's going to see to it that it's put back into your lap what it is that you give. So what is, what is God driving at here? What's that? Yeah. Psalm 29 says, give unto the Lord. And we ask ourselves, God, how do you want me to give to the Lord? How is it that I go about giving to the Lord? And he goes, oh, real simple. Take care of the poor and it is as though you're giving to me. What a profound principle. But how many times have we grown cynical? I know this has happened to me at different times. We see so many poor people, we recognize that they're poor on purpose sometimes. They make lifestyle decisions where they don't want to enter into what the rest of society is doing. They don't want to work hard. They want to do things that, that will gain them the finances that they can easily go out and get. And we grow cynical and say, I'm not giving to them. Have you ever done that? Or I'm not giving. They don't deserve it. They're mean. They're nasty. They're rude. I'm not giving to them. Forget it. Is that what God says? We put conditions on giving much too quickly. And God is just saying, look, when you give it to them, you're not giving it to them. You're giving it to me. When you take care of the poor and the oppressed and the, the down and out and people that can't take care of themselves, you're actually giving it to me. And we can often become cynical in this world of people that just don't do things for themselves. And God's just saying, look, take care of them. When you do it, you give to me. Uh, I think sometimes you feel moved to give to someone and someone else that's in need. You just don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean it's just a personal thing. I mean, you feel Can't, uh, right. Yeah, let me ask this. Can you get a check in your spirit for God to say, don't do something? Yeah. Yeah, and we would be disobedient if we went beyond what the Spirit of God's yeah. saying we to do. Pete's gas station in the summit a couple of days ago, and this one fellow came over and he started pouring himself out. And, and uh, even before he got done with his story, I was going for my wallet, you know. So, uh, right. 
and he was going around. He was in in, in a desperate need, and he was going around and asking for help mm-hmm. just to get himself on the road again and get going. And uh, uh, I wasn't sure about money, and I just thought move to get him, but I don't know what's going on. Sure. And I think there's a distinct difference when we're moved by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And again, the part of that following is, doesn't God also require us to be the stewards and mm-hmm. the descendants, not the descendants, but the descendants? Right. But I think what we're getting back to here is within, written into the code or the law of Israel and how they dealt with one another was taking care of the poor was part of their lifestyle. We're, we're somewhat different. We're, we're non-Jewish. We're Gentiles. And we, are, we have a government that supposedly takes care of the poor. And so everything's already set up. What's our job in it? We could become quite cynical. But that's where we have to listen to the Holy Spirit and say, God, you've given me so much. You want me to be a steward of this. But I recognize your word says taking care of the poor is part of your plan. So what is it that you want me to do? Right. Yeah. Right. And a lot of times we think that, well, I've already given because my taxes are going to the poor, but we got to recognize that God wants us individually to take care of our brother and sisters on the planet, recognizing that there is something that we are to do. I'm sure. Yeah, you get. Here, here's a giver. Yeah. Yeah, I notice that when I give to a certain organization, all of a sudden I get all kind of mailers until I don't respond, and then I stop getting the pleas. But the point is, there, there's an obligation within the nation of Israel that we're looking at from afar off saying, look at how they shared. Look at how they took care of one another. That's an opportunity to lend to the Lord. It's an opportunity to give to the Lord. Now we, we're going to look at the missionary. Paul, go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. The early part of Galatians, Galatians is Paul's testimony. It's his story, what happened to him, and how he ends up becoming a missionary. And he's telling in verse 9 of chapter 2, and When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So there's a, there's a direct uh, correlation here. Paul is being sent out, a Jew, and he's going to be a missionary. He's going out to the Gentile nations, people that have never experienced the grace of God before, and he's going to become a preacher to people that have never heard the gospel. And they get this warning in verse 10. This is James, Cephas, and John say to Paul in verse 10, They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So he says, when you go out on the mission field, one of the very first things we want you to do, Paul, is we want you to minister to the poor. We want you to minister the grace of God to the poor, still keeping in mind that he is a Jew, he's, he's fellowshipping among Jews, and they're about to go outside of their circle for one of the first times in history and minister to a brand new group of people, and they're saying, minister to the needs of the poor. And Paul says, it's already in my heart. I'm eager to minister to the needs of the poor when I get to the Gentile nations. So there's this sense that it's always been a part of who we are in the body of Christ that we recognize the needs of the poor and we reach out and bless them because it is our lending to the Lord, as Proverbs 19.17 says, when we pity the poor, we lend to the Lord. So let's go back to Psalm 29.
verse 1, it says, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. So how would we go about giving glory? What does the word glory mean? Does anybody know what that word means? Credit. Honor. Uh, I suppose credit to some degree. Uh, reverence. Respect. It is the Hebrew word kabod in which one can give reverence and holy respect back to God. So here we are talking about giving to the Lord. David says to all of us, give to the Lord. Our response is, what do you want from me? Well, certainly when we lend to the poor, we give to the poor, we lend to the Lord. That's certainly part of it. But here's an exact example. He says, oh, you mighty ones. Who is David talking about? Who is a mighty one? The righteous. Any righteous person is considered mighty. And he says to them, I want you who are mighty on the earth. Are you mighty on the earth if you know the Lord? Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, right? So if Christ be in you, are you not a mighty vessel of honor? Are you not someone of great power and strength that walks the face of the earth? Sometimes we don't recognize that. Oh, it's just me. No, it's Christ in you. The most powerful being, the one that was there at the beginning of creation, is inside of you. And David says, oh, you mighty ones, give to the Lord glory. And my, my problem is, I, I don't think I have any glory to give. But that's a bad thought about myself. Because what God is actually expecting from us is the glory that He's already bestowed upon you. You can't give glory in and of yourself. Do you recognize that? You don't have honor to really give. You don't have respect to really give unless God bestows it upon you. And then he says, now that I've bestowed this gift upon you, now give it back to me. Give me honor. Give me respect. Give me reverence. Have you ever tried to do religious things without God at the helm? It's frustrating. It can actually bring anger because you're trying to do something good, but God is not directing it. It's not led by His Spirit, and therefore it amounts to nothing. And so when we give glory, we have to recognize that only glory can come from Him. And when glory comes from Him and He distributes to us, He says, now let it flow. Let it flow out of our lives so that everyone around us can recognize that we're not greedy and holding the power and the might to ourselves. We're sharing the glory of God outwardly. That's whenever we hear people... We don't hear it so much in church today, but I think in my grandparents' generation, the preacher would get going and someone would shout out, Oh, glory! <laughs> what they were recognizing is giving glory, sharing it out in the presence of other hearers, saying, This is not mine. What I'm receiving is a gift from God. And I give it back to Him. I give honor back to Him who deserves it. I give reverence back to Him who deserves it. I give total respect back to the one that deserves it. Then he says in Psalm 29 verse 1, Give glory and he says give strength. So what would strength be? What kind of strength can we give? Encouragement. That would be emotional strength that you give to another. Have, have you ever shared emotional strength to somebody that needed it? Somebody was down and out and they needed encouraging words and God was using you to say something powerful to them? Isn't it just like God to stand you next to somebody who is weak or when you are weak, stands you next to somebody that's strong? And He commands out of you, give it. And to hold back strength when you have the opportunity to give it would be being selfish, right? But in your opportunity, God says, Oh, I've stood you up. I've made you strong. Your spine is like iron. I've given you the opportunity to minister to another. Don't hold back. 
Be the strength. Be in their corner. Be what it is that I need for you to be. How else can we share strength? Physically, if, uh, if someone's in need of uh, assistance with something and you're able to... You know, sure. Help them out that way physically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just the other day, I was on, on the hill cutting the grass with my tractor and it was a little wet and it started spinning and I couldn't get out of it. A neighbor saw me in need, came over, physical strength. All I needed was a nudge. But to get off of it, I would have, the engine shuts off. You know what I mean? You're just fighting this losing battle. So you stay on, try to keep the engine going. All I needed was physical push out of the dilemma. Or they could sit there and watch you. Oh, let's see. Yeah. How's he going to get out of this one? John. Yeah. How many of you have ever had a word from God for someone and you just couldn't get away from it? You had to say it. It was a spiritual truth. You know they were going in a wrong direction and God gave you the spiritual strength and fortitude to minister His Word to someone else. It's got to be a part of who we are. God says, I'm not just giving this to you for you. I'm giving this to you because I want you to share your strength. Once again, in the same principle that when we give to those in need, we are actually lending it back to the Lord. It is the same principle of giving to the poor giving to those who need our strength. How else? We talked emotionally, we talked physically, we talked spiritually. What else is there? Is there any other way we can help with our strength? I think our strength is in our uh, uh, well-offness financially. Maybe uh, they're in need of a few dollars to Sure. Sure. Uh, I was researching this word, and where that falls into is political strength. When you have power and ability to help another, and you don't, and you hold it back to yourself, you're being selfish, and you're not sharing your strength where you have it. So we would look at that word politically, and we think the political realm, but it's any area of your life where you have influence and power to help another person. Would you use that strength for the glory of God? And there are good people out there that do that. They use their, their clout and their power and their ability to help other people because they can't help themselves. They don't have the strength. But God has put that person in a place of strength to help others. Does that make sense? So that's the fullness of this word. When you have been given strength from God... He is calling it back to himself and saying, I expect you to use your strength and influence for my glory. Now let's go to verse 2. Now in verse 1 it just said, give the Lord glory and strength. And the second time it says it here is in verse 2, give unto the Lord the glory do his name. Now why would the psalmist who just told us to give glory turn around and say, say it again? Right. Not just the fact that we're supposed to give glory. Here, it's saying it in a way that is non-optional. It is due His glorious name. It is due His holy name. The fact that what we have inside us, a gift from God, the glory of God bestowed upon us, it is non-optional. There are a lot of Christians walking around thinking that giving of themselves is an option. But it's non-optional. It's actually due just like your mortgage is due or your car payment is due or the, the electric bill is due. Glory is due. Holy respect and reverence is due God. So I want us to see it as an outstanding debt that when we wake each morning, ah, gotta pay that bill today. I gotta pay this bill. It's due this morning. As soon as I wake, glory and reverence goes to God. How many of you like to get the bill in the mail before it's due? 
Or how many of you hold off until the day <laughs> that it's due? See, I, as best as I can do, I like to get things taken care of so it's not looming over me. So as soon as I wake up, what do I want to do? I want to give reverence and respect to God. I don't want to keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Because as soon as you keep putting things off, it can be days before you've actually gotten around to giving God glory and honor. I, I, I love the, when the bill comes for insurance or something. It's a threatening letter. And I'm thinking, I always pay it on time. I don't need any more threatening letters. <laughs> That's the language that they've had to get used to using with society. It's true. Now we have the word worship. We've been talking about being genuine worshipers. In the second part of this, it says, verse 2, it says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. This is the Hebrew word worship, is shakah. It literally means to bend your knee and bow in holy reverence before God. Now, I don't know if that's much of a practice that we followers of Christ really do anymore. Bowing before God. I mean, you go to almost every other culture of the world, they bow to each other, they bow to their gods. I mean, everything is like, they bow. It's, it's just normal. But for us as Americans, I mean, we, we have something within us that we really don't want to bow. We really don't even want to ever get on our knee and show weakness. But God says, that's how you show me reverence. That's how you show me worship. Like, well, God, can't we just sing a song? Because, you know, we love you. He's like, a song? That's, that's not it. That's not worship. Worship, the word worship in all of its true meaning is truly surrendering your heart, your will, and your physical body in a posture beneath God. But I know in the society that we grow up in, we've all been taught that we are our own individuals and we can be anything that we want to be and our school systems train us to, to really grow up and be something great. And that's, that's okay as far as that goes, but what's the greatness for? For your own accolades and for your own approval? Or are you going to be great for the glory of God that you can bend your knee before Him and say, God, the talent you've given me, the education you've given me, I bend it all before you and I'll use it now for your glory and for your honor. That's true. That's true. For all that we can be critical about, you're right. There's some things they just flat get right, you know? And bending the knee before God is certainly one of them. Because sometimes we can, I guess, throw the baby out with the bathwater and get so upset at what this church has done and go the extreme opposite way and have no reverence and respect for God. And there's a lot of churches that are, are really going that direction saying, well, we don't have to bow before Him. But what a... Like you said, it breaks your heart within when you can actually bend your knee before God and bow before Him in reverence. And that's what the word worship really means. And it says here in verse 2, Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. How many of you ever thought holiness was beautiful? Did you think, do you think His holiness, living a holy life of purity before God, is actually a thing of beauty. God sees it that way. David, the, the, the songwriter here, thinks it's something of exact beauty that when we worship God, when we bend our will before His, that God finds great beauty in it. Because now you're living a life of purity and holiness before Him. Why should we do this? Why should we give why should we give our money? Why should we give of our resources? Why should we give of our time? Why should we do all of these things? Yeah. David will now take the next seven verses and tell us 
exactly why we need to do this. And for whatever reason, David takes us to this side of God that we're not used to seeing as we talk about God and His beauty and His creation and all of these things. David takes us to this destructive side of God, as it were. Look what he says in verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. Verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, Glory! The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Verse 3, the, ver the voice of the Lord is over the waters. I want you to think of every body of water you can imagine. The oceans, the tides coming and receding. Who's in charge of that? God is. Every river and lake and stream that you've been in, Marty. Teeming with life. And you've, you've described to me when you're fly fishing, you grab a rock and you flip it over and you find out what kind of life are these fish feeding off of so I can kind of get a perspective. Guess who's in charge of that? His, wo his voice thunders over every body of water and he is clearly in charge of every body of water, everything that is teeming with life underneath those bodies of water. God says, I'm in charge. I thunder over all of it and it responds to my voice. How many of you have ever been to a body of water that it's just crashing so hard you can barely hear yourself trying to have a conversation with someone else. His voice is even more powerful than that. It thunders over every loud crash that we've ever heard. And then it says here in verse 4, the Lord's voice is powerful and full of majesty. So what does powerful mean? If God's voice is powerful, what image does that stir up in your mind? What's that? Mighty. Mighty, sure. What else? Gary? What? Sure. What else? His voice is powerful. What do you think that means? Yeah, creative. Do you know that when, every time God speaks, something happens? Every time that He speaks, His voice is creative and powerful. And the other part of the uh, definition of this word, powerful, is it's firm and decisive. In other words, when God speaks, He doesn't say, Oops, I shouldn't have said that. I, I didn't mean to say that. Can I take that back? He's firm and He's decisive when He speaks. And there is creative overflow every time that He says something. That's our God. Does this God not deserve our full respect when He says, Give. Give of your resources. Give of your strength. Give of your might. Give of uh, the glory that I've put within you. Give all of that back to me. When God says it, He says, Look, I'm powerful. And when I say things, I expect my people, of all people on planet Earth, I expect my people to respond. But I think that there are times when we become critical and think, well, I don't really have to do that. Yeah, you do. His voice is the most powerful voice. How can we ignore it? And then it says it's majestic or full of majesty. What does the word majesty mean? What do you think? Greatness. Greatness. Excellence. I think of royalty when I hear the word majesty. 
that there is this royal excellence that he carries with him that every time he speaks, he speaks with eloquence and he speaks with excellence. It's not uh, stammering, it's not with indecisiveness, but with royal power he speaks forth. I know a lot of people aren't comfortable with this, but God is a dictator. He's not a president, he's not a prime minister, he doesn't work under a democracy, he's not told what to do by Congress. You understand what I'm saying? He is a dictator. He is a royal king and he, he declares things over us. And when he says them, he expects a response. That's why he dealt with the nation of Israel. He says, I give you blessings and I give you curses. If you're obedient and responsive to what I say, I'll bless you. But if you're disobedient and unresponsive to what I say, you'll be under a curse. So it's clear that God operates from a dictatorship, benevolent. He speaks forth for our own good, not for our destruction, but for our own good. He tells us what needs to be done. This is his voice of power, and this is his voice of majesty that David relays to us here. And then he says, in verse 5, The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Do I have any cedar fans? in the church this morning. Does anyone like the smell of cedars? Why is David saying that God's voice is more powerful than the cedars of Lebanon? Does anyone know about the tree? It's strong. It's strong, it's straight, and its smell is pleasing. And David said, let's, let's just take this one thing, the cedars of Lebanon, and let's just put that out there in the front. And we say, we all agree this is a really good, strong, solid tree. Now let's put God in the other corner. God versus the cedar. Who wins that battle? David says, without a doubt, his spoken word will shatter that tree like that. Alright, if God can do that to a tree, what can he do to a disobedient child? What can he do to a rebellious one that refuses to listen to what it is that he is saying? And we recognize immediately David is getting at something here. This God is powerful. What we consider strong and mighty, God says, that's a toothpick. Have you ever done that just because you, you could? You know, just snapped a toothpick? Yeah, look at me. Oh, oh, oh. I thought it was really cool when I could crush an aluminum can as a kid for the first time, you know. Crush it. Yeah! Look at this power. Look at this might. I can crush an aluminum can. And yeah, whoop do you do? Right? God looks at things that we see as the epitome of strength. And he says, break it. In fact, I don't even have to do anything. I just have to speak. And that will begin to break before the power of my word. Then he says, look at a city... Lebanon and Syrian. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon. Then he says, he makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian, like a wild, young wild ox. He continues to say about the cedars, not only will I break them, he can take those trees and as he speaks and continues to speak, they'll move like tumbleweeds and just begin to skip down the road. Just powerful, right? I just see the image. I don't know if you have ever get into the Weather Channel and watch tornadoes and the power and the strength of tornadoes just rips things up and spinning them right down the road. That's the voice of God. It's powerful. And then the entire cities of both Lebanon and Syrian he says, I can take both of those. Syrian is, is a reference to Mount Hermon. He says, I can make them just walk before me. An entire city. Ooh, just wipe it off the map. Mount Hermon, I can simply make it just move down the road like a wild ox. I mean, what would it take for us to move a mountain? What is our...